from Austin, Texas. It's The Cube, covering DockerCon 2017. Brought to you by Docker and support from its ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host Jim Kopielis, who's been digging into all the application development angles. Happy to welcome back to the program here at DockerCon, Yaron Aviv, who's the co-founder and CTO of Iguazio. Yaron, great to see you. Thanks. How, how have you been? Great, great. Uh, been we, busy traveling we, a we, lot. We, we talked about, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we, some of us celebrated Passover recently. I had brisket at home. Uh, we had Franklin's barbecue brisket here. Uh, Anthony Bourdain said uh, the only two people that know how to do brisket well uh, are Franklin's and the Jews. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so we had Passover, a lot of uh, good food, yeah, but also a lot of traveling. I was also in a Kubernetes conference in Europe and here. Uh, prior, prior to that, uh, big data show, so it's a lot of traveling. Yeah. yeah so you know, Kubernetes, Docker, ecosystem. Uh, you, you've been watching this. You, you, your your company is involved in it. What what's your take on the state of the ecosystem, and and what do you think of the announcements this week? Yeah. So um, you know, I've also been to the Kubernetes conference, and uh, you see those are still small, relatively small shows, and it's mostly developer uh, focused. Uh, what we see is that sort of Kubernetes is taking a lot of share from the others, because uh, most of the guys that adopt are not enterprises yet. You know, it's people that have a large enough uh, infrastructure that they want to uh, use it internally. And Kubernetes is a little more flexible. And on the other end, you see uh, Docker trying to create sort of a ver VMware-like shrink-wrapped version of container infrastructure. So we see those two. And there's obviously the public cloud with their fully integrated stack. Now what I noticed here in the show and also when I was uh, a couple of weeks ago in the Kubernetes conference that, you know, think about the stack. It has like, let's say 20 components. Uh, so someone like uh, Amazon brings the entire 20 components and it's fully integrated and secure and networking and storage and data services and everything. And here what you'll see is a lot of vendors, this guy has those four components, the other guys have those five components. In some cases actually overlap. So this guy will have three unique components and two other components, et cetera. And it's very hard to assemble a full-blown solution. So as a buyer, how do you decide which components am I going to choose? Okay, and that's part of the challenge and also helps uh, sort of the you know, the cloud guys. Yeah, it goes back, I remember when I first joined Wiki, at Wikibon, we talked about, you know, the hyperscale model was you take your team of PhDs, you know, you just architect your application and software. Mm -hmm. uh, you're the enterprise though, you want to, you know, you don't have those that talent, so you will spend money to buy that, you know, package solution. I want to buy it as a service, I want to buy it, you know, easy. Um, you know, where, 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 where do you see kind of the maturity of, of this market and how that, that fits for kind of what can the enterprise consume, how do they do it, yeah. or do they just go to platforms? Um, you yeah, know, so like, this like is clouds. why we position Iguazio as a platform, we're not a component. We're a fully integrated system, we have multi-tenancy, we have security, we have data lifecycle management, we integrate with applications, uh, we have our own UI, you know, but it's focused more on the data services. So if you take like, dozen uh, Amazon data services like Kinesis and Dynamo and others and object and file, we basically pack all of them because data is the biggest challenge as you know. You know, High availability, versioning, you know, reliability, security, the biggest uh, and toughest challenge are the data. And once you, you solve that one, the applications, they all become stateless. And that's much easier. Okay, now there still needs to be a bigger ecosystem around it which is why we're doing a lot more work with CNCF as the organization that, and trying to create standards uh, for the different interactions between those components. So when a buyer goes and buy a certain component from one vendor, it doesn't necessarily locks into that. It can uh, just go and modify it in the future, okay? But I think once you solve the data problem of the persistency, which is sort of the toughest challenge in this environment, uh, the rest of it becomes uh, simpler. Yeah. So, and one of the questions Jim's been asking this week is, you know, where analytics fits in. I look at kind of your, you know, real-time continuous analytics piece. Um, not an application that I heard talked about too much. Maybe, maybe we can give you your, your viewpoint on and, it. And the relevance is, of course, uh, much of the application development that's going on, the hot stuff, is related to artificial intelligence on right. streaming analytics. So, clearly, which is where we continuous. focus on, you know, uh, some of the things that I try to, to work with uh, different communities is. 
is explain that right now we have bifurcation. We have sort of the Apache ecosystem and we have sort of the Docker ecosystem, totally you know separate ecosystems. And uh, by the way, you know that cloud is uh, where all, most analytics happen. So, yes. so basically analytics and cloud technology have to converge. Mm -hmm. And this is what we've been trying to, to pitch is, you know, why, does, why do you use a yarn as a scheduler uh, where I can use Kubernetes and it's more generic because That's I right. can schedule any type of work, okay? So this is uh, something that we're trying to push in. And all this notion of continuous integration, when we say continuous analytics, it's not just about the real-time aspect, it's also about the continuous development and integration. Yes. Uh, okay. So you actually want this notion of just like serverless you know, function, which is one of my uh, yeah. things, I, one of the things I like, and, and also uh, just immutable uh, code and infrastructure. You want to adopt those notions. So think about, you know, analytics is going to go into real time more and more. Okay, so that means that let's say I have my connected car pipeline that I get streams and I process and I generate insights. What happens if I found bug, bug in my application or I just want to enhance it and create another feature? So I want to be able to just push a new version of my analytics code into some platforms, you know, hopefully ours. And you also and want to train that new algorithm as well to make sure it's fit for yeah, whatever Yeah, but you have to have this fit, notion of continuity version. Uh, which means all the integration with data have to be different. It has to be a lot more atomic. Yeah. It has to be checkpointed. All those things that I can basically knock down my analytic process and relaunch it, and it goes seamlessly and continuous. And that's not the Apache model. If you played around the Hadoop camp enough, it's sort of more a lot more legacy kind of approach. Uh, which I don't connect to. Yeah, uh, Yaron, maybe maybe complete out the stack that you're building. How does a serverless fit into this also? <clears throat> okay, so so basically we're building all the data engines. You know, we're doing streaming, we're doing objects, uh, files, uh, NoSQL, SQL. For us, it's all integrated into the same very high performance engine. And also have built-in analytics, so we can build things like joins and aggregations and a lot of computation on the data as it injects and it could basically present itself as many different things, okay? Now, one of the things that we get asked from customers, and we demonstrate that in uh, Strata, let's assume I'm throwing an image into this thing, okay? I want to be able to immediately analyze the image and say if, if there is a face, if there is something suspicious about the picture, or maybe even simple things like extract metadata information like geolocation of the picture so I can do something with it. So we had to develop internally an event-driven processing within call a serverless in, internally, but where you, you throw data and it basically it immediately launches and triggers a process which is a Docker container-based process that has high-speed message bus integration into our data platform that immediately invokes and, and processes that in a very elastic fashion. So if you throw thousands of objects and basically elastically uh, generates multiple workers to work on that. That's also how we design things like DR and backup internally in, in our platform to be very flexible. So we can build DR to S3. How do we do it? We basically have serverless functions that know how to convert the updates into a continuous stream of updates and then they just go and there is a small code that says, okay, go right to S3. And that allows me a lot of flexibility to develop new features. So this is all this notion of data lifecycle management which is very advanced in our uh, product is actually based on serverless functions. We just didn't call it serverless. Uh, one of the things that we're working now with the community is trying to detach that portion from our product and contribute it as an open source project uh, because it's much faster and much more optimized than what you'll see including IBM WISC or, or Amazon Lambda implementation of that. Are you working with the Apache or are you working in the, in the context of the Apache framework to expose, for example, machine learning pipeline functions as serverless functions. Um, yeah, so again, Apache is not you know, the right necessarily place to, to do that. Yeah, because Hadoop of my and Spark and all those Hadoop things. Hadoop and Spark and yeah. all that. But we do want the Kubernetes environment to deal with all the orchestration requirements for that thing. So the yes. way that we do for you know, TensorFlow integration is that we may expose the, a file into TensorFlow mm -hmm. on one end to yes. be able to look at the image and at the same time, the metadata updates of what the image contains is exposed to, data, to TensorFlow as sort of a key value store or document store. It basically just updates attributes on the same image. So the way that we work for, you know, working with now with healthcare, think about like an uh, MRI image lens. 
and something looks at the MRI image and senses cancer. So basically you can immediately take the same image with records, with fields to say contains cancer uh, by this guy, take picture of this guy. And then yes. uh, when you want to run a query and say, you know what, give me all the MRI pictures that contain query, it now flips and acts like a database mm -hmm. and you just pull all those images. Okay. So it, it basically a different approach to, to how to do those things. So you run, talked about Docker and containers, Kubernetes, serverless. Uh, what do virtual machines uh, fit, 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 fit into the environment? So um, I had some interesting conversations at Kubernetes with some uh, friends that are sort of high ranked in this uh, industry uh, without disclosing. It's like, do you really need OpenStack in between bare metal and you know containers? Because the traditional approach is, okay, you know, we have bare metal, we need to put virtualization layer for isolation, and then we need to put, uh, you know, Kubernetes or Docker. And we figure out that very little amount of risk, actually, in putting, especially with the new security things around containers and image signing and what we do, which is authenticating uh, the container, not the infrastructure on data access, you know network isolation, all those things that eventually can collapse and eliminate uh, virtualization. Uh, but not for every application. You know, some applications with a more traditional legacy uh, application may still require VMs. Because it's quite a different philosophy to develop microservices uh, and develop VMs. And uh, part of what I see here in the show is that not everyone internalized that. Okay? People still think in the notion of, oh, here's my lightweight VM that happened to be called Docker container, and I'm going to give it the volume, and I'm going to create snapshots on that volume, and all that stuff. But if you think about what is really microservices, it's about allowing this sort of elasticity, so the same workload can spawn multiple workers, okay? Mm. Is the ability to go and create update versions, is the ability to knock down this uh, container anytime I want and just kill it and launch it in a different uh, mm. place. If you know how Google works or Amazon or eBay or all those guys, basically killing uh, containers on purpose to basically test their system. So all this notion that my configuration and my logs and all that stuff sits inside the container is not cloud native mm -hmm. and it doesn't allow you this sort of uh, elasticity that you want if you're building a Netflix or an eBay or a modern enterprise infrastructure. So I think we need to put those two things aside. You have a legacy application, keep them in the VMs, okay. You have uh, new workloads, you need to think of data, data integration, and microservices differently as something which is entirely stateless. The image of the container builds from the Git, okay, and create a Docker image. And if you want to go to a different image, you just go and recreate from source the same image. Mm. The data for that image needs to be stored in a data facility like a database or an object or something like that. Yeah, uh, your own final question I have for you is, talk a little bit about the customers that you're interacting with. You know, talk about the, the people that are here, as you said, there, there's a spectrum of how far along they are in the thinking. Uh, you, you're, you're pretty advanced in some of your architectural uh, thoughts and opinionated as to where you're going. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, where are the customers today? How many of them are ready for the future versus, you know, uh, kind yeah, of sticking so, with what they've got? So what you, said, you mentioned before, part of the key challenge for enterprising, uh, enterprises, is they all want to move into the digital transformation. They all want to, you know, be, to be competitive because some some of them have existential threats. Think about even banks. You know, today where uh, Apple comes with Apple Pay, it kills a lot of the margins that you know they're making from all those small transactions. And and now no one really cares how many branches you have in the bank because of all the white generations just go to their yeah. uh, mobile app. So someone like a bank have to immediately transition and be able to offer uh, premium services, offer better experience through the mobile application, be able to analyze the user behaviors and things that are more strategic. So the traditional things that IT deals with, like uh, exchange server management, you know, SAP, all those sort of uh, legacy things, will move to the cloud because there's, there's no real value in it. And what you see is more and more enterprises thinking about how do we generate the differentiation, which is more about analyzing data and be able to provide better service to the customers. And the biggest challenge is they don't know how to do it because what the industry tells them, go to Apache, 
and take a dozen of projects and now integrate those and figure out the security problem. And you know what? You want to add Kubernetes? That's from a different story, but let's try and, and glue this together. And that's extremely complicated. So what mm -hmm. we're trying to do is go to those customers and say, you know what? We're building a full-blown solution, fully integrated, security is baked in, all the different data services. It integrates with things like Kubernetes natively. Uh, we actually do the extra mile of, we actually build like uh, Spark and TensorFlow and all those already images that contain everything, uh, including the support for us that you could just launch Spark and it connects and works. Um, so it, we, we want to make life easier for those enterprises to solve those uh, key challenges that they're working on. And this is working extremely well for us. Actually, the challenge we have, we only have, I think, two sales guys, and we have a huge pipeline, and we can't really uh, deliver uh, for most of those projects. Uh, well, it, good challenges to have sometimes. Yes. So I talked about <laughs> scaling, which has been one of the themes of the week here. You're on Haviv. Great to catch up with you Excellent. as always. We'll be back with uh, two days of our coverage here at DockerCon 2017. You're watching theCUBE.